Shout outs to Andrew. He got me my first coffee ever. And if you guys would like to support the channel directly by getting me coffee, because sometimes I make it at home and I'm about to do that and show you what I do, but you can look at the link below because that's a great way to support the channel directly if you would like to. Surprise, we're gonna do this review while I'm in my car. I don't always wanna be locked up in the studio or inside, and sometimes I like to be outside, but it's just so bloody hot today. And it's just one of those weeks, every day is 100 plus, and it's kind of humid, so just icing on the cake, you guys. And I thought it'd be a fun mix up to do a review while I drive. So let's see how it goes. Now we're filming vertically, because if I filmed horizontally, you'd actually just see my steering wheel right here, mostly covering my face, which is probably not ideal. Ooh, speed bump, is it too rattly? Nah, we good, awesome. So if you're watching this, hopefully you've seen my last video because then you'll be up to speed. In that video, I talked very highly of the Pure Aero 98. And I mentioned there is one more racket that seems to be a worthy contender. And that racket is, I'll let you guess, but I'll give you some hints real quick. It is not a Babolat racket. It's hint number one. Hint number two, it is also a 1620. Ooh, now we've really narrowed it down, haven't we? Are there any other good hints to give you? Oh, you know, I'm gonna take the scenic detour. Not that you guys will enjoy the view. This is more for me and to buy time before I pull up to my place. Yeah, also, I just wanted to do this because I can kind of be inside and outside at the same time, you know? I'm like in my car, but I'm moving around. I got the sunlight from all these windows coming in. Normally sunlight comes through here, but it's summer, so I have it covered. It's a glass sunroof. But other than that, I can kind of pretend I'm outside. But I got that air conditioning, baby. So let's keep this show on the road. All right, final chance to lock your guess in right now, just in your head, all right? I will reveal the racket in three, two, one. It's the Head Gravity MP. And quick side note, since I kind of like denser string patterns, eh, or I have a lot of reasons to, I did heavily test this racket alongside the Gravity Pro, but I quickly discovered the Gravity Pro is not as spin friendly as the Gravity MP. And actually the Gravity MP isn't as spin friendly as I was hoping. So I don't need to make this video super long, but let me tell you guys, the Gravity MP will not be my next racket. But let me tell you why it caught my attention because I think that's really interesting. But I'll also tell you ultimately what led me to decide it's not the racket for me. And I'll try to get through these points as quickly as possible. First off, the listed swing weight, at least according to Tennis Warehouse, which isn't really an official source of that kind of thing, from my measurements, it was a lot higher than my expectations were set from Tennis Warehouse. And from what I understand, Tennis Warehouse takes a pool of six rackets measures them all up after stringing them with whatever string. It's not like they always use the same string for every single racket, but if they're measuring six rackets, I do believe they use the same string for those six rackets. Point being that some rackets that they're going to measure will have a heavier string in it than other rackets they might string with, say, I don't know, a multi-filament or something. Anyway, that's a little variable that they don't really disclaim. And you're not getting unstrung swing weight specs which I kind of wish they did both. If you guys are gonna string up the racket, why don't you just throw it in the swing weight machine and measure it before and after, that way you have a strung and an unstrung swing weight, right? It's not like an extra step, really. Well, it is, but you can just throw it in there. It's not a hassle. Anyway, my point is that you can't really rely on Tennis Warehouse to give you a reliable expectation of swing weight because you don't know what strings they're putting in there and they're only measuring it from a pool of six rackets. And it could just so happen that their average of six might just lean towards one extreme more than the other. So who knows if the listed swing weight that they have for their Gravity MPs is actually quite a bit lower than you will get. So let me tell you, when I measured my Gravity MP, the first one I got was actually of a higher swing weight than a freaking Gravity Pro. And then the other two that I measured were barely, barely any lower than the swing weight of a Gravity Pro, which is annoying because I thought it would be so much lower. So that was actually one bother. And when I got my MPs to the customization and balance that I like, I was really just trying to match it more or less to my pure arrows. That way I could narrow down the playing characteristics to things that were different about the racket that weren't about the balance and so on. It was just besides that. Right, so in other words, I tried to make the rackets as alike as reasonably possible, which took adding a lot of weight to the handle actually. And I did a video on this, 
you can't reduce the swing weight from adding weight to the handle. Likewise, you cannot reduce swing weight by taking weight away from the handle. So I think the specs that make that racket look a lot lighter don't necessarily translate into a racket that's much easier to swing. So that was kind of a letdown. Also, it turns out that the racket, the MP, has a lower twist weight on average than the Pure Aero 98, which affects the stability a little bit. And I couldn't really do anything to get the swing weight to be as low as my Pure Aero 98. It wasn't so far over that it felt like a whole different racket for that reason, but it was a little higher than I wanted, especially relative to the twist weight. And I have an interesting observation and theory about that. And I'll actually throw into this point the reason that I was so intrigued by the gravity in the first place. So you know how that gravity has the teardrop shape? It means that the lower half of the racket has a lot less surface area than the top half, more so than most rackets. But by pushing that sweet spot up towards the tip of the racket with that shape, I thought that this racket would give me better reach than most other rackets of a standard length. And that really intrigued me because I used to really be about extended like the rackets for that reason. That journey is kind of said and done, but I've always liked the idea of having more reach. And how cool would it be to have more reach in a racket that's actually standard length? That way you get the benefits of extra reach without the consequence of an extended length racket. So that just really intrigued me. Also, this racket has the parallel drilling and the small grommets. You know how I'm all about that. I pretty much won't even mess with a racket if it doesn't have both now because it turns out there are enough out there that I can probably find something I really like with that criteria. So it had all that going for it. But let's talk about how that head shape affects things in the real world. And I learned some stuff about sweet spot, about dwell time. Pretty interesting, but I'll try to gloss over it quickly. Two interesting things happen with that teardrop shape. So the string bed opens up a little bit more towards the tip of the racket than it would with the standard shape, but a lot of the racket head shape material also moves towards the tip, which means that the weight is actually more concentrated towards the tip because that shape just moves towards the tip. An annoying consequence of that though is that the three and the nine area on the head gravity series is quite a bit closer together to achieve this shape. And just by shortening that distance, you reduce the inherent twist weight the racket would have. The reason smaller head sizes are less stable generally is because the distance between the three and the nine is shorter. It's the same reason shorter rackets have lower swing weights, all other things being equal. So yes, you can bring that twist weight up by adding weight to the three and nine, but simply by having a bigger head shape or the three and the nine area being further spaced apart, you will have a higher twist weight without having to increase anything weight related. So by moving some weight away from the three and the nine area and moving it towards the 12 to achieve this teardrop shape, this racket decreased its twist weight and increased its swing weight. Theoretically, right? But that also turns out to be the reality when I measured twist weight and swing weight. And honestly, I don't love that. It takes a little bit of stability away from the racket and it makes it harder to swing. The racket's heavy enough to still be stable, but I just don't like that trade-off. Now it's harder to swing and whip around in addition to being a little bit less stable. That's kind of an annoying trade-off for me. Now, if you like to hit a little flatter and you wanna hit through the court, I do think the Head Gravity MP and definitely the Head Gravity Pro are better for that kind of shot. Better for those attacking and penetrating flatter balls. However, that might not be a specialty shot of the Pure Aero 98, but that's totally a shot you can do with it. It just takes a little adjustment on the technique end and a little more precision because I think the margin for error for that kind of shot is smaller on the Pure Aero 98. That racket is better at driving heavy topspin balls, but it's also a very versatile racket. It can do both. It just leans in the direction of spin, whereas the Gravity series in general dials that back a bit and is better for more penetrating flatter shots. But of course you can still get decent spin with that racket, notably more with the MP than the gravity. But for me, not enough. So all in all, those are the reasons that I'm not gonna be switching to the gravity MP. But I think the things I learned on that journey were really interesting. I recently posted a short about an observation I made on racket head shapes in general. So on every single racket, there is an intersection on the head shape where you have the longest mains intersecting with the longest crosses. And that location is generally going to be a little bit above 
where the center of the head shape actually is. And this is where the conversation gets pretty technical and interesting, and I don't want to say things that I don't fully understand, but I'll tell you it as I understand it, with the disclaimer that I might misunderstand certain things or I'm not fully explaining everything. So if you do or think you do, feel free to chime in in the comments. It was actually from that video that I posted where I marked these locations on a racket that I got some pretty insightful comments and messages about these details. So cool stuff. We definitely got some racket nerds on the channel. It turns out that the sweet spot of a tennis racket is not simply the location of the longest main and the longest cross where those things intersect. That location seems to be referred to something as the area of optimal dwell time. Now, I'm not sure if there's some kind of industry terminology that refers to this point on a racket, but imagine a trampoline. Whether you have a square-shaped trampoline or a round-shaped trampoline, there is an ideal area in the center of these shapes where you will get the best jump. And that concept is essentially the same on a tennis racket. However, the physics of how the forces interact on a tennis racket are so different because a tennis racket is more so like a trampoline that has a handle on one end and you're using the handle to swing this trampoline at a tennis ball. That's why it's so different. Trampoline is stationary. It's fixed on the ground. It is equally supported on all sides. A tennis racket has a head shape that is only attached at the bottom of the head shape where the throat is and the handle comes afterwards. So structurally speaking, the racket is heavily relying on the structural support of the throat area. And since the racket relies so heavily on the structural support of this trampoline racket head shape, that affects where the true sweet spot is. And that moves the sweet spot down a little bit towards where the structural support is. So here is a good way to wrap my understanding up of this. If you take just the shape of the racket, the ideal place to hit the ball should be at the intersection of the longest main and the longest cross. However, it's not that simple because a tennis racket is not a trampoline. So the structural support towards the bottom of the racket also moves the sweet spot down a little bit because the racket is just more stable down there. So the location of the sweet spot is actually kind of a compromise between those two areas. And the third detail to add to that, somebody brought this term to my awareness, is perimeter weighting, which really just means that there's weight across the perimeter of the racket head shape. And the more weight that you have towards the tip does help to move that sweet spot up. Because once the racket is really moving, that weight towards the tip acts a lot like a structural support would. So the actual sweet spot location of the racket is some kind of compromise between the shape of the racket head, the structural support towards the bottom of the racket head, and how the racket head's weight is distributed. All those things play a factor in to where the ideal area to hit a tennis ball is. So my observations of where the sweet spot should be if you're looking at the longest main and the longest cross just isn't looking at enough factors. But I imagine the head gravity does move that sweet spot up a little bit. Like I said, the head shape does move that intersection of the longest main and longest cross up slightly. And by reducing the weight around the three and the nine and concentrating it towards the tip, I think that also pushes the sweet spot up just a little bit. So it actually might be possible that there is just ever so slightly a little bit more reach on that racket. However, I don't really notice it when I'm playing. And on top of that, there's something kind of weirdly unforgiving about the sweet spot on the gravity. So anything below that sweet spot feels really unforgiving, actually. And I think it's because the crosses get a lot shorter, a lot faster than they might on some rackets. Maybe I could have had more time and gotten a little more acclimated. I actually used to be a head gravity pro guy back when the first generation of them came out. And in my memory, that 1820 gravity pro back in the day got a lot more spin than today's 18 by 20 did. But I'm just going on memory. That was a while ago. Point is I used to own a gravity and that was actually a racket that I had for quite some time. One of my longest standing rackets actually. But there it is, that's my journey so far. Head Gravity Pro and Head Gravity MP didn't quite make the cut for me, but I feel like I did get to know those rackets pretty well. I'll probably do a review on them just so I can talk about those rackets in isolation. That way you guys can decide if it's right for you. Definitely not knocking the racket, just saying it's not quite for me, but it does have a good set of strengths that I think is suitable for a lot of players, especially between the MP and the Pro. But between those rackets, I would absolutely choose the Pure Aero 98. And I do want to say I am still looking around, although the Pure Aero 98 consistently seems to be the racket to beat. But we do seem to have a couple of potentially worthy challengers, especially one. 
In my last video, I left that a mystery. I wasn't really trying to be a cliffhanger guy. I just needed to wrap that video up. So this time instead, I will tell you the rackets I'm now messing with alongside the Pure Aero 98 are the Head Extreme Tour, mostly because that one has the parallel drilling and small grommets, and I just haven't messed around with it. And people have asked me to on the channel. So I'm like, okay, let's give it a try. It's kind of hard for me to get past that weird avocado color scheme that they're going for because I want to give my rackets a custom paint job, but how am I going to pick a custom paint job that I like with that weird pastel green grommet color? I don't know. I don't really want to work with that color scheme, but I'm going to try to look past that and see if I actually really love that racket besides the colors. I don't know if I will. We'll see. It's swing weight's kind of low in stock form. It's almost like a low powered and I don't even know if it's a more comfortable E zone 98, but it's kind of like a lower powered E zone 98. The string pattern seems really similar, but if it gets decent power and really good spin potential and pretty good control and feel, it has a shot and its string spacing is definitely a little tighter than the pure Aero 98. And I always appreciate that for the durability that brings to a string bed but I definitely trip about that less because I use Restring Zero and Wasabi these days. So durable, so much spin, affiliate links below. I always speak so highly of those strings because I love them so much. They're so good, so impressive. And the other racket is a Dunlop SX300 Tour. Really open string pattern, actually. I don't think quite as open as the older Babolat Pure Arrows, but slightly, slightly more open than the Pure Arrow 98 now. So longevity of the string bed, it might break for me a little bit more soon than it would on the Pure Arrow 98. But again, I'm using Restring Zero and Wasabi and they last longer than anything else will, except maybe Kevlar, but I'm not gonna hit with Kevlar. I wonder if Kevlar would actually last me longer, but I'm not trying to use Kevlar. I'm not even, that's not even a serious consideration. And the SX300 Tour gets a terrifying amount of spin. And surprisingly, it's comfortable. Crazy, crazy enough. I actually, I've been stringing that racket at 56 pounds with Restring Zero which is the highest I've strung anything for myself, I believe. It's definitely the highest I've ever strung Restring Zero. Typically, I recommend stringing that one just a little lower than others, whereas I did 48 pounds in the Extreme Tour, and that feels about right. But we'll see. I'm getting to know that racket still. I know the SX Tour better. Ah, so we'll see. Stay tuned for reviews on both of those rackets, and we'll see in the long run if one of those two seems like a more worthy rival of the Pure Aero 98, and ultimately if one of those does rival the Pure Aero 98. I gotta say, the spin potential of the Dunlop is addicting, and it's hard to let go of that. But its power seems a little bit more uncontrolled without spin compared to the Pure Aero 98. Which, no surprise, you know, it's a 16 by 19 versus a 1620, and its string pattern is ever so slightly more open. But it's still surprising to me how comfortable that racket is. So I'm gonna keep playing around with it. Also, all of these rackets have, besides parallel drilling and small grommets, they actually have a handle that is long enough, I think, for most people with two hands. I can't say that for every racket. Sorry, my car's just let me know what's around me. Thank you, thank you very much. And we're parked. And that's always something I consider is handle mold length. Because rackets like blades and especially pro staffs, it just kind of sucks using those with two hands. But those aren't rackets I would actually switch to anyway, even if they did have the right length handle. But for some people, that's an issue or a bother. If you're looking for rackets with a long enough handle mold, these three might be something to check out. Also, most Yonex rackets seem that way too. Anyway, the journey continues, but I do imagine it will come to a close soon. Thank you for watching this video while I drove around. And let me know what you thought of this style of video. I like the idea of driving around and talking about rackets, but let me know what you think. All right, that'll be all for now. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to check out the affiliate links below. All the products that I link there are products I use and fully back. Some of my favorite products of all time. And you can also check out my Amazon storefront for products I use to customize my rackets or socks that I wear and like. All kinds of things there. I'll do a video on my Amazon storefront. I'm still kind of putting it together, but I get a really small commission from that as well. Again, those are all products that I swear by. And I'll break down why in a future video. But for now, check them out, see what you like. And if you want to directly support me, you can buy me a coffee. There's a link for that below. Generally, I don't buy coffee, but even if I do, it helps support the channel a lot. So I really appreciate that. I appreciate you guys watching and subscribing and liking and commenting. So all that good stuff. Keep it coming and I'll keep the content coming. Appreciate you guys. All right. Well, I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now. All right. Onto the coffee. These are the basic ingredients. I use unsweetened almond milk usually. I'm not a connoisseur at the house, so I have some instant coffee from Starbucks. I guess this will be a little bit of a mochaccino because we're using cocoa powder. Cinnamon, 
Splenda, but it's Stevia. It's generally what I do if I'm home. All right, we're going to heat up that unsweetened almond milk because it needs to be warm enough for some of this stuff to dissolve. All right, this milk is steamy. Measuring spoon, a little bit of coffee. Not too much, actually. That might be like, I don't know, 80 milligrams of caffeine. We are going to put in some heaping teaspoons of this cocoa powder. One of these, maybe another half one, and then some monk fruit. This stuff is really sweet, so not too much. And now we're gonna stir this together. There is a bit of a method to this stirring. See how it gets nice and frothy like a cappuccino? Unsweetened almond coconut creamer. Only 10 calories per serving. Gonna blend that in and honestly, we're pretty much done. I'm gonna heat it up a little more though. Does it really have to beep five times? Excessive. Look at you, you're looking good. Anyway, sometimes that's how I make my coffee. Every now and then I'm out and about and I buy one, but this one's on Andrew. Oh my gosh, you guys, I forgot to put cinnamon in here, but it's not too late. Just a little, a little dash. I kind of feel like I'm feeding a fish bowl. <laughs> there we go, I'm gonna stir it in, obviously. Okay, now it's ready. Thank you, Andrew. I'm squeezing this cup in just before my 10 o'clock hit. They also have coffee at the club, so I just might. It's so hard to say no to free coffee. All right, thanks again. If you guys want to support the channel via getting me coffee, I'll shout you out in the next video.